I am James Jimmy Garvin, and I received the name of Jimmy Garvin once I walked on Howard University's campus 44 years ago. I walked on campus, I was six feet one, I was weighing 181 pounds. So they called me Little Jimmy. <laughs> 44 years later, I'm still six feet one, but now I'm weighing 238 pounds, <laughs> okay? And somewhere inside me, that little man is trying to get out <laughs> to make sure that he's, he's seen again. But uh, once again, thank you so much. And I'm going to talk about uh, my life. I'm going to talk about my life uh, from beginning to end. Um, there's a lot to cover. I'm going to try to get through it. And uh, if, I, uh, if I'm going too fast, I want you guys to say, slow down and pump your brakes, okay? And I'll, I'll come back and catch you. But uh, I'm from a, I was born in Immokalee in a two-room shack uh, in Commerce Camp. How many of you guys know where Commerce Camp is or was? Commerce Camp is about six miles outside of town on Highway 29. Um, my mother was a migrant worker uh, and my father was a logger. You guys familiar with those two forms of employment? Yeah? Yes, no? Okay. Now, my father, who was a logger, would wade out into the swamps of Collier County and up to his waist, and he would hook logs. And they would bring the logs back into town to the sawmill, where they would cut the logs up and turn them into lumber. Um, neither one of my, my parents had a formal education. Um, they both probably finished about the third grade. Now, I want each of you to arm yourself with a writing instrument. Uh, those of you who have smartphones, iPads, iPhones, there's a note section in there. Uh, I'm going to give you guys some takeaways tonight uh, that I think you, you would love to have uh, in terms of how I survived uh, growing up in poverty. Okay? When you find your phone and you found the section, say, I got it. And if you need some more time, say, Lord, help me. Okay? <laughs> Let me know when you're ready. You got it? All right. Now, the first takeaway tonight is the topic of my speech, which is you can't have the miracle without the misery. Okay? That's the first one. It's just the same thing as you can't have the blessing without the burden. Okay? You can't have the miracle without the misery. The second takeaway is my five P's to success as, as to how I survived uh, the poverty side, um, going to Howard University and, and matriculating through, uh, and then going on to be employed by uh, the Marriott Corporation and then golf course specialist and owning my own golf course and the whole nine yards, okay? Now the first P um, that I want to give you is planning, planning. Okay. Planning has to be involved in anything that you do. You must have a plan. The second P is patience. You have to allow your plan a chance to work. Most of us write out a plan, and if it doesn't work in two days, we quit. Okay. You have to stick with it. My third P is passion. You have to be passionate about your plan. You have to be in love with it. Okay, you have to be in love with it. And my fourth P is persistence. Persistence to me means your worth ethic determines your worth. Okay, how hard you work, how often you work is going to determine what your worth is. Now during my journey, I used three types of plans. Okay, I had a mental plan, one that I conceived up top. I had a verbal plan, one that I verbalized, and I had a physical plan. That's where the three come together, 
I actually get out and get it done, okay? Now, something else that I did was I talked about the fear that we have as it relates to getting, being successful. Now, there are three words that are together, but one of these words don't fit. Fear cast, forecast, and faith cast. Which one of those words don't fit in that equation? Fear cast, forecast, and faith cast. Fear cast. You're absolutely right. Fear cast is when we're afraid of something that's, go, that's something that's upcoming, okay? But if we have our faith cast in place, our faith cast will allow our forecast to work. You follow me? Mm -hmm. Is that making sense? Yeah. yeah. Okay. One example I use is, you know, when you're getting up in the morning and you're worrying about the outcome of a situation, and instead of worrying about the outcome of a situation, you put your faith cast to work, to allow you to forecast the outcome of the situation. And you move through it that way. That helped me a lot. The fourth thing I want you to take away from this is the principle is in the priority. Okay? The principle is in the priority. Everybody with me on that? Okay? If it's important, it has to be prioritized. Those are some of the things that I use. Um, some of the things that we all suffer from um, is the types of shame that we face. And I faced all types of shame growing up, okay? Um, body image, we're, we're ashamed of our body, okay? Trauma that happens around us. Health, be it physical or mental. Money and religion, okay? Those things were very important for me when I was growing up, to look at that as a reason to get out of poverty. Now, I had a lot of heroes, as was, was stated in the, in the video that you saw up front. Um, one of my biggest heroes was, was Mother Jelps. Uh, she uh, came to my aid when I was 14, as the video said, and uh, my father had just passed, and uh, my mom was, was you know, nowhere to be found, really, because uh, my father would get paid on Friday, and my mom would take the paycheck, and she would leave us for two weeks, and we wouldn't see her, and my dad had to be the primary care caretaker for us, and, and we would struggle. But uh, she said to me when my, when my dad passed, she said, if you ever need anything, just call me. And uh, luckily she was there and she moved me in with her. And uh, I was, that, at that time, that's when I began my journey uh, to manhood and going into high school and, and understanding what life was really about and matriculating through high school and moving on to college. Henry Jones was my basketball coach. Uh, he was very instrumental in, in helping me to get out of Immokalee. He and Mother Jelch worked together and, uh, I didn't have any financial support as it relates to move, leaving, these, leaving Florida. Uh, so they put some money together and made sure I got a plane ticket. And uh, the next thing I know, I was up at Howard University. But I got that by way of a friend uh, whose name was Sam, and, and the airport was, was not built in Fort Myers yet. So we had to travel all the way to Tampa uh, to catch the, air, the airplane. And so t Sam actually put me out at the airport in Tampa, and I board the plane. and. I get in D.C., I get off the plane, and I'm standing outside, and I'm looking for Sam. I'm like, where's Sam? You know, because I thought he was going to be there to pick me up. But that was the fear of a young man who had never left home before. Now, luckily, my mom actually put a note in my jacket. So she said to me, if the transportation director doesn't come to pick you up, look to your note. So sure enough, he didn't come. Over my jacket, and there was a note that says, call a cab. So I got a cab, and I, I, went, on to how, I went on to Howard University. Um, Chuck Hinton was, was very, very instrumental in my life when I got to Howard University. He was my baseball coach. Uh, he was the one who I credit a lot of my success to because from him, I really learned how to become a man. He had a baseball team and he was an ex-major leaguer and, and he treated all of his kids like his son. And me, more so than them because I was lost. I was a lost kid from Florida who had never been away from home uh, and I was, I was afraid. And so he actually took me on his wings, and uh, he and I became close. Um, one example I'll give you is um, my first semester at Howard. If I move around, you guys got to tell me that I'm going. Am I going too fast? You okay? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, 74 through 78 when I, when I approach Howard. Uh, once I get to Howard, uh, my major was music. 
okay, because I was a John Philip Sousa Award winner in high school, and I thought that I could actually go to Howard and become a musician, music, mu musician while playing baseball. Well, the burden was too great. Uh, my first semester, I had a piano teacher, her name was Miss Burwell. And so um, I would hustle into piano practice in the evening after baseball practice. And one day she said to me, she said, son, um, if you're going to be a musician, you're going to have to spend more time, you know, over in, in their music department. But I said, Miss Burwell, I'm, a, I'm on a baseball scholarship. She said, well, son, you can't make it in music if you don't put time in. So at that point, I looked at her and she looked at me and I said, well, Miss Burwell, Baseball is going to win out because baseball is paying the bills. So I ended up changing my major to therapeutic recreation, and um, I was successful in that. Uh, Bob Brock. Bob Brock was um, uh, the president of golf course specialists. He's another hero of mine. Uh, Bob um, operated three golf courses in the D.C. area, and um, I wanted a job in golf. Uh, when I met Bob, uh, there were no jobs available in the golf industry in, in the D.C. area. So he asked me to come back next year to reapply. I did so, and I'll get into the details as I go back. But I did so, and in doing that, Bob decided he was going to retire some seven years later. And uh, he was semi-retired in Towson, New Mexico. And when he came back, he stopped by my office at Langston and said, hey, I want to retire, but I won't do it unless you become the president of Golf Course Specialist. Now, at that time, the company had been in business for 25 years, and they had never had an African-American partner before. So I became the first partner and the first president of Golf Course Specialist in the D.C. area. Scott Clyde was another angel of my life. Scott was uh, my first uh, manager with Marriott. I worked for the Marriott Corporation for a while. Uh, short story about Scott. Scott was at Capitol Hill Hospital in D.C. Scott then turned and got a promotion down to Tallahassee, uh, where he became the general manager down to Tallahassee. And he said to me when, I, when he left town that, hey, I'm moving to Tallahassee. If I find a job for you, I'm going to call you. He did call. I didn't think he was going to call. He called. And um, I told my wife, I said, babe, we got a chance to go to Tallahassee. Uh, and she said to me at that point in time, well, you know, whatever you want to do, I'm with you. And Scott at that time offered me a 15% raise and a two-grade step increase with the Marriott Corporation. So that, he was big for me in my life. Uh, Randy Clare, who helped me start my Bahamas International Golf Team with the kids that we have in D.C. We would travel to the Bahamas and St. Lucia. Randy helped me start that program. And we'll talk about him a little later on. And uh, my ride or die, who's probably my biggest hero, is my wife. Uh, I met my wife in uh, 1975. We met in speech class. And um, at that point in time, um, I would give a speech about baseball, and I would always, you know, receive an A, and she would get a B, and, and she wanted to know how did I get A's, and she got B's, and I said, well, because I'm talking about a subject that I know, you know, I know baseball, and at that time, uh, I saw her, and she was the cutest thing I'd ever seen, and, uh, and uh, I chased her until she caught me, okay, <laughs> and uh, when she caught me, I told her, I said, if you ever leave me, I'm going with you, so we've been married for 34 years, and we've been together for about 40 years, so she's my ride or die, and I love her to death. Uh, now, going back to Howard University, I'm going to backtrack now and give you guys some, some uh, meat to put on the bone as I talk about it. My freshman year, I told you about my music major. My freshman year was the toughest year for me leaving home uh, because I had never left the state of Florida. First time being outside of Florida and being that far away from home, it was a challenge for me. Um, first, year wasn't, first semester wasn't so bad. Um, I made uh, the grades to stay in. Second semester, um, I didn't make the grades. So naturally my instinct was to leave Howard and come back to Immokalee. Now NC2A rules was, you know, 1.8, you can still play. Howard rules was 2.0. I had a 1.8. So the athletic director and Chuck went round and round about me being able to participate and uh, the school won out. So I had, I lost my scholarship. Uh, I'm ready to pack my bags and come back to Immokalee. I went to Chuck's office and said, Chuck, I'm going home. He said, no, you're not going home. He said, you're going to go over to the uh, administrative bill, tell Mr. Roscoe to give you financial aid for one semester. That'll give you enough time to regain your scholarship, and we'll take off running the next semester. 
Without him, I'd have came back to Immokalee, wouldn't know what the future would hold, and who knows where I'd be. So I owe him a lot of gratitude for, for understanding the talent that I had and, and the ability that he had to make sure that I stayed there and matriculate to, through college. I left Howard. Um, Howard was great for me. We had a great time. Baseball team traveled all over the country. Uh, we played some of the top teams in the country. We played the University of Miami, Florida State, Clemson, University of North Carolina. So we was the only predominantly black school that played those top tier baseball, baseball teams uh, when I was at Howard. Um, I left Howard in 1979. When I left Howard, I had not completed my degree. I had two options. I could stay at Howard, stay in the D.C. area, try to find a job, or I could come back to Immokalee. This is where another angel comes into my life. Jake Felton, who was the athletic trainer for the baseball team, he and I were good friends, and he said to me, go see my son, Kevin. Kevin was living in a house on 7th and Webster in D.C. Uh, it was he and another gentleman named Sam, Sam Dade, who three of us became brothers. And I went to see Kevin, and I stayed there. Now, I'm in D.C. with no place to stay and no job. So I started to do anything that I could do to make a living. Um, I um, started selling encyclopedias. Any, any of you ever sold encyclopedias? <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the hardest jobs I ever had in my life. Now, we didn't only sell encyclopedias in D.C. We sold them in New Jersey. We sold them in Southeast D.C., some of the toughest neighborhoods in the world. So my wife, who was not my wife at the time, had a green Mustang, and she would allow me to use her car. And I would travel throughout the country trying to sell encyclopedias. And at the end of the week, my total says I had 18 sets sold. When I got back to the business office on Friday afternoon, he'll tell me, he said, well, no, you didn't have but three sales this week. I said, something's not right about this. But anyway, I tried that for a while. Uh, I cleaned offices at the Department of Agriculture. Uh, one of my buddies was a friend of mine. Uh, his sister was working down there, so he allowed me the opportunity to work down there with her. So that helped me, you know, uh, progress through a little bit. And uh, my big break came when I... Um, one of my roommates, Kevin, who was Jake's son, was working at Children's Hospital. Uh, Kevin um, was about to leave the hospital for another job, and he asked me, he said, hey, man, do you want to work at the hospital? I said, yeah, I love working at the hospital. So he said, okay, let me set up an interview for you. So he set up an interview, and I went in to see Marilyn Glant, who was the uh, dietitian uh, in the department in which I started to work in. And um, we met, and she liked the conversation in which we had, and she gave me a job. So I became uh, an employee for Children's Hospital. I was the porter. Now, the porter's job is to carry trays up to the different floors, and so I was in love with that job. So I had worked there for probably about two months, and the director from the hospital, his name was Len Snyder, he said, hey, man, say, have you ever thought about working for the Marriott Corporation? I said, no, I, you know. I, I never thought about it, you know, because I'm, you know, I'm, this is the first time in my life that I'm making a steady paycheck. You know, I'm not selling encyclopedias. I'm not, you know, I'm not cleaning offices. I'm, I'm doing something that I know that each two weeks I'll get a steady income. So he said, um, if you want to work for the Marriott Corporation, he said, you have too much education to be here doing this. He said, you need to become a Marriott employee. So I, um, he set up an interview with me uh, with uh, the VP of Operations for Marriott. And when I walked into his office, the only thing he asked me was, you know, how much of a salary is it going to take for us to get you? So he was another angel uh, and put me in place to, and I started working for Marriott at Children's. And then from Children, I moved to Capitol Hill Hospital, which is in southwest Washington. And that's where I met Scott Clyer. Scott and I became good friends, and he took me with him to Tallahassee. Uh, but Scott left me in Tallahassee. I was there for about a year and a half. I was running in front of the house. I was cash operation catering. I was in charge of a 24-hour operation. We were making about $65,000 a week in the area in which I was managing. 
Scott left me and he got a promotion back to D.C. area, back in Virginia to become a district manager. And this is the first time I experienced any sort of racism going through the system. Uh, Scott left. Ken Martin became my boss. Ken said to me that um, we have some problems. I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, well, you were not my choice. Scott's gone now, and uh, you know, we're going to have to make you go away. I said, okay. I said, well, the only thing I want you to do is you know, give me 90 days to get back home to get a job, and I'm fine. So as it worked out, when I left the D.C. area, Dick Eisenman, who was a superintendent at Rock Creek Golf Course, one of the four courses that we operate in the city, he and I were friends. And he said to me when I left, he said, hey, if you get down to Florida, and if you need a way back home, just call me. I will hook my wagon up to my, my truck, and I will come get you. So sure enough, I called Dick. I said, Dick, you know, I got to leave Florida. He said, do you need me to come get you? I said, no, I can make it home. I said, I need a job. He said, I can't pay you what you're making for Marriott, but I give you the highest paying job that I have. And that was about 14 bucks an hour then, about 1980-something. So I got back to D.C. I went to work for Dick at Rock Creek Golf Course on the maintenance side of the business. So I learned the maintenance side of the business, mowing greens, fairways, uh, mowing rough, manicuring bunkers. And I learned all the, all, the, all the bad stuff first. And so, <laughs> so when I got to uh, Rock Creek, uh, they moved me to Langston, where I finally ended up staying for 20 years. So when I moved to Langston, uh, I went to, to assist a buddy of mine who was the then superintendent there, Marty Clark. So when I got to Langston, uh, Marty and I are friends now. When I got to Langston, the first thing he gave me was a shovel. You know, I'm like, wait a minute, why are you giving me this shovel? He said, well, J.G., somebody's got to do it. I said, okay. So I stayed there for about two weeks, and uh, I met a gentleman by the name of Tex Guillory. Tex was an avid golfer. And Tex and I had played a few rounds of golf together through my baseball coach, Chuck Hinton. So as I met Tex, Tex asked me, he said, hey, have you talked to Bob Brock about one of those management jobs? I said, well, Tex, I don't know Bob. He said, I know Bob. He said, I'll go to Bob and ask him you know, to give you an interview. So I went down to, Rock, to, to East Potomac. Tex did follow through. I got the interview, and, but there was no job. So I went back to Langston and I worked probably about two or three weeks more at Langston, and then I get a call. The lady comes out from the office and said, hey, Bob Brock wants you to come to East Potomac. I'm like, my God, what have I done? I said, all I did was go down to, to interview, and, <laughs> and now I'm being called on the carpet, you know? So I went back to East Potomac, and, and Bob said, Jimmy, he said, in this business, things change really fast. He said, I want you to go back to, to Langston and tell the young lady to give you the keys and from this moment on, you're going to be the general manager of Langston Golf Course. Mm -hmm. So that's how I transitioned from all the ugly stuff to becoming the general manager of Langston. Once I got at Langston, um, I, um, for two years, we worked under the same umbrella. Langston was part of one of the four courses in which they operated. But Langston was, was a golf course that was built in 1939 for African Americans to have a place to play golf in D.C. There's no place blacks were allowed to play golf in D.C. until they built Langston. So once I got there, um, the first thing I did was go to the park service who owned the land because Langston was boarded up with metal bars on the windows. Okay? And the first thing I did was ask permission to take those bars off the window because I wanted Langston to be more inviting than it was to push people away. Even though it was in the bad part of town, I still wanted people to know that they can come to Langston and have a good time. So once I got there, I worked that job for about two years and they decided to um, build another corporation, if you will. So they took Langston out of the fold with the other two golf courses, three golf courses, and made me the president of Langston Legacy Golf Corporation. So they started a new golf corporation because they felt that an African American should run Langston because it was in that part of town. So I became the president of Langston Legacy Golf Corporation uh, during that time. <clears throat> um, so once I got there, um, I stayed there for a while. Stayed there for 20 years, actually. Uh, that's a while, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so I stayed there for 20 years, and uh, that's the time when Bob decided he wanted to retire. Uh, he had semi-retired in Taos, New Mexico but he would come back each summer to visit. And one of his visits on the way back, he said to me that uh, 
he was thinking about retiring. I had also sold my shares in Langston Legacy Golf Corporation because we couldn't stand alone. We was not generating enough revenue. So I showed, sold my shares in that and I became a partner in Golf Course Specialist. So once again, here I, here I am again becoming the first African American partner the company had ever had. Doing that, we were very successful, but Bob had enough and he wanted to retire. So he stopped by and asked me what I thought. I said, yeah, I'd love to do it, but let me talk to the folks that, are, that have been so instrumental in my life in terms of how I move uh, through it uh, from leaving poverty to now. And that was my wife, and we were now married at that point in time. And it was Dr. Banks, who you guys saw in the video, and that was Mother Jells. And once I cleared it with those three and made sure they felt that I was doing the right thing, I said, yes, Bob, I'll do it. So he said, Jimmy, I want to tell you something. He said, you know, I will trust you with my life. I said, okay, Bob, I appreciate that. And so I became president of Golf Course Specialists in 2006. And I stayed there until um, 2012. Uh, in 2012, I'll talk, talk a little bit about the justice system. And to, everybody so far, okay? Am I doing okay? All right, okay. In 2012, um, the justice system came knocking on my door because I was working with a DC city councilman. Uh, I have a foundation called the Jimmy Garvey Legacy Foundation. That foundation tutor and mentor kids, mentor kids as you saw in the video, and we travel with those kids. So I was in search of some support from the city in terms of helping to establish more funds so that the kids could do more and get more out of it. So a, a city councilman came to me and said, hey, I have an idea that I can help you get some funds for the program. I said, okay, I love that. Now, I was introduced to this young man by my baseball coach from Howard, so I trusted it, okay? Didn't do any vetting, I trusted it. So as it turns out, we did get the funds. Um, to make a long story short, we got about $400,000 for the program. Out of that $400,000, now I'm supposed to be teaching golf programs. That's all I do. Teach golf, travel with the kids, clubs, shoes, that kind of stuff, make sure all right. I did my job. He took some $300,000 and bought a car, motorcycle, golf clubs, latest perfume, you name it, he did that, okay? Now, when the Justice Department knocked on my door, I said to them, hey, you know, I did what I was supposed to do on my side of the table. I said, I'm not the one. I said, Dr. Banks, who you guys saw, was the chairman of Langston Legacy Golf Corporation. I said, Dr. Banks has all of the paperwork as it relates to the foundation. You need to go talk to him. So they did, and Dr. Banks and I didn't have anything to lose, so we gave them everything that they wanted. Uh, so we gave it to them. Long story short, um, I got charged. Um, didn't do any jail time. Um, went to see the judge, standing in the judge, judge's chambers, and he said to me, Mr. Garvin, he said, if I sit on this bench for 20 more years, I'll never meet a man in my courtroom with your character. But unfortunate, a crime was committed, so I got probation and some community service. And uh, in 2012, 2015, that's when I wrote my book uh, about my life and, and all the things that I had actually been through. And, um, and so far, so good. Uh, I'm back again. I'm, on my own golf course with three other brothers in D.C. And uh, just to give you some history, there are over 15,000 golf courses in the, in, in the country. And there are only five golf courses that are owned by African Americans. So we've been very fortunate and blessed to be able to own our own golf course. And we have thriving programs going on. Any questions so far? Are there any other golf courses in the cities? Uh, there's one in um, Clearview, uh -huh. Ohio. One in West Virginia. Uh, Sheila Johnson has one in, in the, uh, say it again? Clearwater. Clearwater area. That's us. And uh, what we are planning to do is put together some type of uh, African American golf trail, uh, like the Bobby Jones golf trail, where you buy a package and come and play um, all of the different properties. Okay. Um, you guys got to ask me some questions, you know? <laughs> you know John Merchant? John Merchant. 
Yes, sir. I do know John Merchant. Yeah, I do know John Merchant. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Born and raised in a mockery. Mm hmm. Since you left the mockery. Yes. What did you came back to a mockery to do to help the people in the mockery? I, uh, for six years I came down and we worked with uh, Village Oaks Elementary School. And I would take 20 kids from Village Oaks and I'd take 20 kids from Naples and we'd end up at the Ritz Carlton for the weekend. And we would actually teach them golf. We would also stress education. Uh, we worked with Florida Gulf Coast. They would come over and support us with their program. So I'm still, I'm in the process now working with the high school to help them start a golf team in Immokalee. So I've been very active in terms of, in terms of trying to help and give back to, to Immokalee. Yes, ma'am. And I think I worked like three or four years with you on that project. Uh, with, the kids. with the kids. Yeah, and one of the things that was important for me was to get the kids out of their normal environment and show them something that they can aspire to do. But they have to understand that in order to do that, you have to walk the straight and narrow. And education is very important. And that's what we pushed all the time, education. Now, before I, uh, how much time we have? I'm good. OK, before I, I'd like to bring my niece up, Altamese, and uh, have her read a, a passage from my book. And there's something in this passage that she's going to read that should touch everyone, because we all have to uh, be in position to, to to give back as you were talking about. Can you see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Um, before I start, I just would like to, um, can you hear me now? OK, before I start, I just would like to say how proud I am of my uncle. And as uh, the young gentleman asked, what have he done in Immokalee? I was one of those teachers where I gave him some of those students to go on those field trips. So a lot of our African-American students never played golf or were not familiar with golf, but being able to be, have someone accessible has really benefited the students. And I am still a teacher at Village Oaks Elementary and just on um, yesterday, he came out to the school and I'm gonna be blessed to have him come back again and read to my students. So I'm very proud of my uncle. Um, just a little escort. Lastly, it is important to note that everything you have achieved thus far is a blessing and both the beginning of a lifelong journey and a debt that you have incurred and you must pay what you owe. You have earned the responsibility and debt of gaining a degree. You owe every teacher that stayed after school with you to help you with a science project or tutor during math. You owe your parents or your spouse, who for some of you skipped meals and made other sacrifices so that you would have the opportunity to sit with us here today. Those of you who are from immigrant families, you owe for the sacrifices that have been made in order for you to have a better life. For the African Americans in the audience, you owe all the way back to the slaves who didn't have the legal rights to read or write, but bled so that you can sit here today. Make no mistakes, you have achieved much, but there is so much more left for you to do, and you have an obligation to honor the responsibility that you have been given. Please understand that your degree is a responsibility and a call to service. Fulfilling that obligation is simple, give to others. Help someone who cannot help themselves, someone who can gain nothing from, simply because it is the right thing to do. Provide an opportunity for someone who has the opportunity to be you in 10 years. Pay forward what you have received. This is the responsibility and accompanies your degree, that accompanies your degree, excuse me. And all of you are strong enough to carry it. I live my life with five P's. Have a plan. I needed a plan and a plan B. Be patient, persevere, don't stop. Be passionate in pursuit of your goal and realize all of the possibilities. Remember this, if you tell me I forgot, if you show me, I might remember. But if you teach me, I'll understand. I close simply with this. 
Education is not a degree, but a lifelong journey towards knowledge and understanding. The value of that education is measured in how you use it and how much you share with the world. For what is in your head can be used, but never taken away. I just want you guys to, to hear that because all of us um, have some work to do uh, when it comes to supporting one another. Um, we are born with a common gene that we all have. It's called the HPLP gene, and it's helping people live their potential. Uh, so when you pass by a stranger, uh, someone in need, try to find some way to help them. Just say hello. Uh, just see how they're doing. Uh, I know I'm very familiar with that because uh, when I was growing up in Immokalee and I would ride the school bus and my mom would be standing on the corner uh, with the other alcoholics and the kid, kids would make fun of me and there was nothing I can do about it at that point in time. But uh, I knew in my heart that at some point in time I'll be strong enough to support uh, whatever she was, what was going on with her. Um, alcoholism, alcoholism is a disease but we didn't know that at that point in time. Uh, we didn't know what was going on with her. I just know that she was not home in the house uh, taking care of us. So it's very important that you, you help those who are in need. And uh, There's a lot of folks in this country that are suffering from uh, mental illness and homelessness. So we have to help those people. Uh, do what you can to help them. Now, uh, I'm also going to talk a little bit about, um, um, I want to give um, some special thank yous to uh, my friend who drove up from West Palm Beach today to be with us for this uh, glorious occasion. Mr. Clewis Wright, thank you so much for coming up. Um, now, any questions before we move to the next? Yes, yes ma'am. Um, what made you decide to move from management to, owner, to ownership? Well, it, it, was, it was an easy decision uh, to, to do that. And it was the right opportunity to do that. Um, there had never been, um, there were two golf courses owned by an African American in the Washington DC area prior to us. Those two golf courses went under because there was no support for them. Uh, the property in which we attain uh, is in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. And it's 162 acres and we're gonna turn that into a destination place where we're not only gonna service golf, but we're gonna service the entire community, uh, we're going to build a STEAM gymnasium uh, with science, technology, engineer, engineering, and math uh, as, part of, as part of our workforce. Uh, we're working with STEAM. We've actually put STEAM and golf together now. Uh, so I think it's very important that our kids are, are up on today's uh, technology and engineering and all the things that need to be successful because, uh, as you can see, no one has pen and paper. Everybody has an iPhone or iPad or or an Android or whatever you call it, so it's modern technology. Um, so that's, that, that was the transition for me. Um, being in position to do it, understanding the nature of what we were undertaking, and uh, the ability to help others uh, was, was what, what was the driving force behind. Um, there's a lot of opportunities in golf that we don't take advantage of because we don't know they exist. Uh, most of us don't feel that we can own, but we can. Well, we just have to be mindful of the fact that it's going to take a lot to get it done. And we were able to do that, and I'm, I'm proud of that um, accomplishment that we made. Next question. Yes, ma'am. What happened to your mother? She died. Uh, she died when I was 14. Uh, and then Mother Jelts passed um, a couple of years ago. So both my moms are not gone. And um, I had um, my sister... I had four sisters and I was the only boy. They were two younger and two older. Uh, we lived in that two-room shack. We didn't have any running water. We didn't have an indoor toilet. We didn't have a place to take a bath. In our front room, we had two beds um, that my sisters and I shared. We had a um, wood fireplace in the front. and the back, we had a table, a refrigerator. We had a stove. And we had my mom and dad had a bed in there. That's where I grew up. Um, we, one of the famous rituals for us was not having a place to um, 
used the bathroom was each spring we had to had to dig an outhouse, you know, and that was that was some of the degrading stuff I've ever done in my life, but it was necessary for me at that time because we couldn't do anything else. Uh, so it uh, it kind of helped shape my life. Uh, one of the things I did in Commerce Camp when I was growing up to uh, survive was I would um, um, the seniors in our, in our community and they they didn't have any indoor plumbing as well, so I would actually take those night jugs out for them early morning just to make some money uh, because I was trying to survive, you know, and uh, so I don't have any shame in terms of anything that I do now that's legal uh, to help someone, and uh, that's how I got my start. Uh, now, uh, when I was learning my trade in baseball and basketball and football, I was, it was in Commerce Camp. We didn't have any, any, any gymnasium. We had dirt grass and woods. So I would go out to play stickball with my friends and one day we were playing and I, I cut my toe. Now, this is when I really knew I was poor. Uh, I cut my toe almost off. So I go home and I tell my mom, I said, Mom, you know, I've cut my toe. And she says, boy, I said, we can't go to the doctor. She said, then I'm going to put some turpentine on that toe and some cob and some spider web. And, and that's how my, my toe healed, but I still have the mark some 60 years you know, ago. So uh, I was born in Commerce Camp. I was born to a midwife. Um, there was no hospital birth for me. Uh, so you guys know what a midwife is? Yeah. <laughs> so, was it Mother Perry? Sir? Was it Mother Perry? <laughs> if it was, I, I don't remember. <laughs> But I'm just glad she was there, <laughs> you know. So uh, I was born to a midwife, and, 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 you know, we didn't have any insurance. If you got sick, you just, you were sick. Mm -hmm. And so that, that uh, done a lot to shape my life in terms of uh, trying to find a way to get out of there. And, um, and once I got out and uh, I became success successful, then my job was now to give back, you know, because it's so important that we help others who are less fortunate than we are. And uh, that's, that's been a driving force in my life uh, to make sure we do. Uh, with my, I have a foundation. It's called the Jimmy Garvin Legacy Foundation. I have some little trinkets back there you can take with you. Uh, and we um, mentor and tutor kids through golf and education. Uh, Learning Center K through 12 where, where the kids come in. And uh, it's real live work, uh, K through 12 academics. And we also think about the moms and dad in which we're servicing as well because we have welfare to work in there for the parents. So now when the kids come, then the parents can also come and get what they need to be successful because uh, the kids now bring things home to the parents that they can't help with. And we found out that the education part was so important because during the summer months, most of our kids leave, lose a half grade point each summer because they don't have access to computers. So we, we set up a, a full learning center for the kids. Uh, doing that. Any other questions? Ask me something, even if you know the answer. <laughs> How did your sisters turn out? Well, they they all they all passed off. They've all gone. They died. Um, my two younger sisters passed, and my two older sisters have passed, and I'm the only one left standing on uh, my mom's side of the tree. Uh, so um, it's been. Um, did you uh, they stayed in Immokalee. Um, one of my sisters did eventually move to, to Lee Acres, because that's uh, after me and Deborah's mom. Uh, she moved to Lee Acres, and they, they bought a house there. And uh, my other sister never made it out of Immokalee. Um, and two of my younger sisters passed. Uh, Lucille uh, died uh, with some type of ailment. And Bernice was uh, mentally challenged, so she never went to any formal school. She went to um, um, the uh, special needs school and she loved and one of the things I learned I loved about her was no matter when you saw her or where you saw her she always had a big smile on her face and a big hug for you and uh, that's why I'm so so fond of, of having those those type of children um, who are in need of some support and uh, we have special needs classes as well for those kids yes ma'am I gave that speech at uh, Heritage Institute um, and um, 
I think it was 2010, they invited me down to speak uh, for their graduation. And I thought it was very important that I say those things to the graduates that were getting out uh, because we all have a debt to pay. Uh, we didn't make it this far by ourselves and uh, certainly we all had some help and we need to thank those folks who helped us. Uh, but most of us, once we make it, then we forget about those folks who are left behind. Uh, so we have to find a way to, to go back and support those folks who need some help. And that's why I wrote that. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes. Uh, the movie, the, the name of the movie is, is entitled Immokalee. Uh, and uh, I felt that it was important that I write, that I name it Immokalee because that's where I'm from. And it's about my life. And I want, I want to pay homage, homage to my, my hometown. Yes, sir? What's the, uh, my home is it? What's that's what it means. Yeah. What it means. Yeah. yeah, it means my home. Yeah, yeah my home, yes. Um, and the uh, subtitle is uh, Legacy of a Common Man, The Walk Was Uphill. Uh, so my journey has certainly been uphill, but um, I wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. I've, I've enjoyed it. Uh, even though it was a struggle, it was necessary, and we made it through. So, you know, I give all, all, all praises to God for that. <clears throat> okay. Now it's time to thank the organizers of the event, uh, Collier County Museum. I really, really, really thank you guys for having me. Uh, um, I've enjoyed it. I've had, I've had a good time. Hopefully you guys have enjoyed me being here. Um, thank the audience for your participation. Uh, you guys had some, some great questions. Yes, sir. Before you run, you know Hollis Riley? Hollis Riley. Yeah. Is Diane O'Reilly his wife? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, I know Hollis and Diane. So okay. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, boy. Yeah. <laughs> He's smooth, but he isn't that smooth. Yeah. <laughs> Diana. <laughs> Diana was actually on my board when she lived up in the D.C. area. So she worked with me in terms of getting the kids to the Bahamas and St. Lucia and all all that good stuff. So they're very, very fine people. Um, now, uh, I'd like to have, um, let's see, Deborah, did you, you take care of me? No, did you take care of me? You get, okay, okay, just grab them for me. Okay, all right. Now we're going to show you guys the trailer from my upcoming movie. Uh, we're going to show that. That's the last thing we're going to show. You get an idea of, of what, what we're thinking about and how we went about trying to create it. Now it's going to be Hollywood up. You know, you guys know that Hollywood is going to take it and they're going to do some stuff to it. And uh, hopefully, you will still remember what we were talking about uh, when you see it. Now we're working with um, Touchstone Pictures, is one of the groups we're working with, uh, E1 Entertainment. Uh, the OWN Network, uh, and several others have interest in producing this movie for us. And as I speak, my entertainment attorney is out in California now trying to, to find a better deal for us. So hopefully we can get this thing done um, by the end of the year because uh, it's been a long journey and, you know, I, I just want to get it done and so I can move on to the next project. Mm. Now, I have one more takeaway to give you, and that is you have to face it before you can fix it. Huh? You believe that? A lot of times in life, we have what I call self-denial. We won't face the situation, and it lingers and it festers and it lingers. But as soon as we face it and we put a plan together, mm -hmm. then we can fix it. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. So remember that you must face it before you can fix it. Um, I hope you guys have been as blessed as I have from this experience. Um, please visit my website. 
Um, it's www.jimmygarvin.com, and it has all of our upcoming events and all the things that we're doing uh, with the foundation. Uh, we continue to help those who are in need, especially those children uh, who need our help. And um, if you guys are ever in uh, the Washington, D.C. area, uh, please come by to see me. I'd love to have you guys come by the golf course and uh, just have a meal or just have a good time. Just see the property, okay? Um, we are waiting for my niece to come back. And hopefully she... In Upper Marlboro? Sorry? Is it in Upper Marlboro? Yes. Yes. Okay. You, I was one of the students that went up there, and I remember oh, from the golf course. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's great. I'm glad you could make it. Yeah, thank you for coming. Are you still involved in golf? Um, a little bit, not too much, but I remember I had the chance that you uh, sent me to Washington, D.C., and yeah. I was supposed to go to the Bahamas. Uh huh. That situation with my passport. Okay. No, but that's great. All right. Now I want to I want to personally thank some folks. Uh, Altamese, would you come up, please? Come on, Deborah. Hmm? Hmm? Thank you for all the hard work you that you've done and and making this possible for me to be here tonight and. Um, I love you. Thanks so much. Okay. Miss Murphy, I have some for you. Yes. Thank you for making this night possible. Oh, well, thank you. Oh, I couldn't have done it without you. Thanks so much. And I have, um, she said she was coming tonight, but she has worked very, very hard. Uh, her name is Bridget Toons. Some of you guys may know as Bam, but uh, on May 17th, I will be inducted into the Markley Sports Hall of Fame, and she has worked hard about that. Yeah. Um, it has been uh, a long journey, and I'm just glad that my work was not forgotten, and um, they realize um, the contributions that I made to the school when I was there. Uh, one of my buddies is here tonight. He and I uh, go way back, Mr. Hodge. Uh, he and I worked together <laughs> during the summer program, and we, we had the young folks on our wings, and uh, we really bonded during that time. And uh, he was another angel in my life because he was there for me, and uh, I'd al I would always tease him, hey, man, you're going to bring me some of that Hodge chicken salad, you know? <laughs> and, uh, his famous chicken salad, and he would bring that for lunch, and uh, that was another way I was, you know, making sure that I got something to eat. So uh, there were a lot of folks that, uh, that I, I won't mention, but that were there for me, and, and they made it possible for me to be standing before you today um, as a successful businessman. Uh, and uh, I understand that I didn't make this journey by myself. So I want to thank all of them for being there for me. And before you leave, I want to show you guys the, the snippet from my movie so you guys can get a look at it. Um, I love you guys. Thank you so much for coming, and I hope you guys have had a great time. Thank you.